The story begins with a group of players who face a skeleton army. They start fighting and destroying the skeleton army one by one. Just then, the most feared skeleton lord named Mamonga appears in front of them with his guild members. They are shocked to see him, and in the next moment, they are badly defeated, lying on the ground. This is a GMMORPG game that is going to close soon. All the players leave the game one by one. However, the skeleton lord wants to spend some time in the game before it closes. As he opens the door, and he enters inside. As the guild leader, all the NPC servants bow their heads before him. He checks the details of the servants and discovers, the man is Seba's and the others are combat mates. He orders them to follow him, and they do so faithfully. They reach a large door, which opens to reveal a king's throne. Mamunga walks towards the throne, with all the servants following him. Albedo, another servant, is already there to welcome him. He commands his servants to stand by, and they follow suit. He sits on the throne and gazes at the beautiful Albedo. He starts checking her details, noting that she is the strongest NPC of the Tomb of Nazarick, supervising all the guardians. The last line about her mentions that she's a perfect beauty on the outside, but a b**** on the inside, a description written by one of Mamonga's guild members. Mamonga thinks this is terrible and decides to delete it. Instead, he adds a line that says Albedo loves Mamonga. However, he soon feels embarrassed for doing so, and the cute Albedo just stares at him. He then commands everyone to bow down, and they all follow his command. Now, he waits for the server to shut down, and as this is his last day in the game, he recalls all his guild members, realizing it was fun to play together, but apparently, they've all left. As the countdown ends, he realizes the server is still running. He gets up in shock and cries, what's going on? Albedo asks him, what happened, Mamonga-sama? He looks down at her, and she asks again, Lord Mamonga, is everything alright? She comes closer and asks, is there any problem, my lord? However, he's in complete shock that an NPC is talking to him. He tells her, my GM call is not working, and she feels sad, saying, I'm also not able to use that GM call function. Mamonga looks at her lips and thinks, her mouth is moving. As she talks with him further, he's confused if he's talking with an NPC and if this is some kind of error in the game. He can use all the functions but can't contact the administration for help. He then commands Sebas to go out of the tomb and check the surroundings around Nazarick. Sebas replies, Understood, Lord Mamonga. He commands the combat maids to guard the ninth floor of the tomb from any intruders. They all follow his commands and leave. As he is thinking about how to contact the administration, Albedo asks, Lord Mamonga, what shall I do? He asks her to come closer and she desperately follows his command. Her smell is so good and he's shocked that an NPC character has a human-like scent. He then grabs her hand and finds out she has a pulse. Albedo blushes as he thinks about how an NPC that runs on AI program looks so alive. He thinks, I'll test one final time, and asks Albedo, can I touch your chest? She responds, of course, master. Please touch me as much as you wish, and goes closer to him. As he touches her, she screams and blushes. With this, he concludes that there is a possibility that this imaginary gaming world has become real, with all the NPC characters becoming alive. He then stops fondling her, and Albedo asks, you're going to take me for the first time here and now, right, Mamonga-sama? Should I remove my clothes myself, or would you like to remove them? But he stops her, saying, now is not the time for doing all this. She apologizes, and he says, it's fine, I forgive you. But I have an order for you, gather everyone in fighting Irana on the sixth floor. Albedo says, I'll do anything you wish, bows to him, and leaves to follow the command. He then gets up and teleports to the sixth floor with the help of the teleportation ring. As he walks toward fighting arena, he thinks, Albedo and others are loyal to me just like their settings, but I want to check the loyalty of other servants too. He enters the arena but remembers that the guardians of this floor are twin elves. Just then, one of the elves jumps down from the top, running toward Mamongo and welcoming him to the sixth floor they guard. He looks around for her twin, and Aura asks her twin to come down and greet Lord Mamongo. Mari jumps down and runs toward them, apologizing to him for making him wait. Afterwards, he says, I want the help of both of you with something. He shows them his weapon, telling them it's the strongest weapon, the Staff of Ain's Ulgaon, which has the power of a god level. They are amazed by such a powerful weapon and say, it's amazing, Mamongo-sama. He says, I would like to run some tests with this staff, and Aura says, we are ready for that, Lord Mamongo. He summons the primal fire elemental beast with the help of the weapon, which amazes the twins. As the powerful fire beast appears in front of them, Mamongo tells them its level is in the upper 80 seconds. He asks Aura, do you want to try fighting with it? Aura seems excited, but her twin is a bit scared and tries to leave, but Aura stops her. Now, they both are facing the fire beast. Mamongo commands the beast to attack the twins, and they get ready with their weapons. As the monster attacks with fire from its mouth, Aura jumps towards it and attacks it. 
but it attacks again, so Mare forms a magic shield to protect Aura from it, and they continue their fight with the beasts. Momongo concludes, as expected, this is a piece of cake for the twins. As the elven twins are fighting with the fire beast, Momongo contacts Sebas and asks if there is any problem outside the tomb. Sebas tells him there is a slight problem, and Momongo tells him to come to the sixth floor and report to him. Meanwhile, the twins have destroyed the monster and come to Lord Momongo. He offers them water as they might be thirsty after fighting and they drink it. Afterwards, Aura says, Lord Momongo, I thought you would be a scarier person, and he replies, I can be if you'd like me to. Just then, another cute NPC appears and approaches them with an umbrella. She starts arguing with Aura, while Momongo thinks, is this another world where NPCs are similar to humans, and wonders if he can return to his old world. But he doesn't have family or friends in his real world. As he's contemplating all this, all the guardian NPCs summoned by him start appearing. They gather near him, and Albedo, the leader of the Guardians, tells them to greet Lord Momongo. Demiurge is the guardian of the seventh floor. Aura is the guardian of the sixth floor, along with her twin, Mari. The guardian of the fifth floor is Cossidus. The guardian of the first, second, and third floors is Shaltier. Lastly, Albedo, as the leader of the Guardians, bows her head. She says, except for the guardians of the fourth and eighth floors, all the guardians have gathered to bow before you. Please bestow your order upon us, Lord Momongo. We all offer you our complete loyalty. Momongo orders them to raise their heads and tells them, I'm confident you'll be able to fulfill your duties without fail. They all are pleased to hear that. Just then, Sebas appears and tells him the situation outside. He explains that the tomb of Nazarick has been transported to an unknown land for some reason. Upon hearing this, Momonga instructs each guard to strengthen their defenses and asks Mari to conceal the tomb, with dirt and dummy hills around the area. Afterwards, he asks everyone, what kind of person am I to you? They all praise him, calling him their supreme lord. After hearing their thoughts, he tells them to continue working faithfully in his service. When he leaves, Shaltier mentions that Lord Momonga's amazing presence has excited her until her panties got wet. This enraged Zobito, and they both start arguing about who will be the official wife of Lord Momonga, as they both love him very much. While, Demiurge and Cossidus are pleased that if Lord Momonga will accept these women's, they could get a chance to serve Momonga's heir too. Demiurge then intervenes and stops both of them, saying, Lord has given them duties to follow, and they decide to discuss this matter later. Afterwards, we see Momonga is in his room contemplating how powerful he's here. A maid comes and gives him a sword, and he transforms himself into a warrior class to check how powerful he is using the sword. He then tells her, I'm going out for a bit. Maid informs him, guards are prepared to go with him, but he insists on going alone. He teleports outer area of tomb, and as he moves forward, he's shocked to see three guards already waiting for him, they are here in Demiurge orders. Demiurge appears and says, Lord Mamanga, I can't let you go all alone. So Mamanga allows only one to follow him. Demiurge starts following him. As he reaches outside, he's amazed to see such a clear sky. With magic, he takes out a pendant, puts it on, and flies up into the air. Demiurge also transforms himself and follows his lord. On reaching the top, Momonga loves the scenery and talks about how beautiful it looks. He then says, taking over the world might be enjoyable, and Demiurge is ready to follow his lead. However, in his mind, Momonga thinks it's just a bluff, conquering this whole world is kind of impossible. He then sees Mari working on cloaking Nazarick, so he goes down to praise him for his work. Mari excitedly runs towards him, and Momonga tells him, I'm impressed by your work. As a reward, he gives him a ring to teleport like him. Mari loves the gift so much and thanks his lord. Just then, Albedo appears, she's looking very beautiful. She approaches Momonga, saying, I'm here to check on you, master. She then looks shocked for an instant at the sight of Mari wearing the ring. Momonga is spooked for a second and gives Albedo a ring too, explaining that he wanted to give everyone rings. He tells Demerge he will give him a ring later and as he leaves Albedo cries out happily to have a gift. In the next scene, Stornoff and his knights are heading to the attacked village to rescue it. Someone wicked planned to attack the village to trap Stornoff, the head warrior of the Riestai's kingdom, and gather enough firepower against the king. Stornoff knows he's a target but is determined to fight those who destroyed their villages. Meanwhile, Momonga uses a mirror of remote viewing to check the surrounding area of Nazarick. Just then, he spots a village and thinks a festival is taking place. However, on closer look, he realizes it is being attacked by knights who are killing people mercilessly. Those trying to stop them are slaughtered in an instant. Sebas asks, what shall we do? But Momonga doesn't see any benefit in helping them. He changes his mind when he sees Sebas, who reminds him of his old friend Touch Me. Once, when Momonga was about to be slaughtered by enemies in the game, Touch Me appeared and eliminated them with a single slash. Momonga asked, why did you save me when you don't know me? 
touch me replied, saving someone in trouble is common sense. So, Mamanga decides to go and help the villagers. He commands Sebas to raise Nazarek's security, tell Albedo to join him, and send few skilled soldiers for rescue. He takes out his magical staff and with the help of magical gate leaves for village. At village, a girl named Enri is protecting her sister Nemu as knights are about to slaughter her. But suddenly, they stop and Enri is confused why they didn't attack. It's because they're shocked to see Magical Gate appearing out of nowhere. When in return to see, Lord Mamanga appears with his god-level presence. Everyone is scared to see him. He uses Grasp Heart Magic to crush Heart of a Knight, and he dies instantly. Another knight calls him a monster, so Mamanga approaches him and attacks with Dragon Lightning Spell, and he dies with shock. He then summons his Death Knight, which appears and takes over the dead body of the knight and transforms into a monster. Mamanga orders him to kill all the knights who are attacking this village and he runs to follow the orders. Albedo, just emerging from the portal in full armor, questions what to do with the human girls, referring to them as lower life forms. Mamanga clarifies that, for now, only the knights in armor are their enemies. He gives Emri a red potion for her injury. She hesitates to take it and her sister also stops her. Mamanga is confused about why they're not trusting him. This enrages Albedo and she's about to slaughter them but Mamanga stops her. He then convinces the girl to drink it and her injuries are heals instantly. Afterwards, he asks her if she know about magic and she says yes, so he tells her I'm the magic caster. Mamanga casts protective spells, anti-life cocoon and wall of protection from arrows, to ensure girl's safety. He gives Enri two small blow horns, allowing her to summon a goblin army for protection if needed. Now as he's about to leave, both sisters thanks him for saving them. Enri curiously asks his name and Mamanga pauses for a while. He then turns and finally reveals Iamain's Ool gown. Meanwhile, the Death Knight summoned by Mamanga wreaks havoc on the attacking knights. They are shocked to see such a huge monster and the Death Knight's cries instill fear in everyone. A knight attempts to run away, but the Death Knight appears in front of him, slaying him with a single blow. Another knight attacks with a sword but unable to pierce his body and sword breaks, he turns and throw him away. Whoever tries to run away gets slayed in that instant. Chief of the Knights is horrified by this and instruct his comrades to buy some time and be his shield. He steps back and sees a dead body, just then the Death Knight looks at him and starts approaching him. He sires for help, and as Moster gets too close, a dead body of Knight reincarnates as Zombie, holding Chief's leg and making him freak out. He falls down and gets stabbed by the Death Knight again and again with the villagers watching as he asks for help from his comrades. After stabbing him to death, Death Knight looked towards others. Vice Chief tells everyone to calm down and retreat, asking one group of knights to buy time for them. They try to stop the monster, but it slays them one by one in an instant. Seeing this Vice Chief himself run towards the monster to fight him, attacking with his sword. But Death Knight slays him into two, killing him. Just then, Mamonga appears and stops the Death Knight. Everyone looks at him, he looks so majestic with a mask and albedo by his side. He comes down and introduces himself as Ains Gown, the magic caster. He allows surviving Nyx to flee with a warning to tell their superior if you cause Taubel in this area again, I'll bring death to your kingdom. They all run to save their lives. Afterward, villagers asks him who are you and he tells I saved you from attacking knights and they thanks him. After ensuring the villagers safety, Mamanga gathers information from them about this world. He learns about this world's economic system, and the other kingdoms like Riestai's kingdom, Baharuth Empire, and the slain Theocracy. At a funeral site, Mamanga chooses not to resurrect the dead villagers, fearing the complications. Afterwards, when he prepares to leave, he advises Albedo to treat humans with kindness and she agrees. He then sees villagers talking with each other and approaches them. Village chief tells him that some knights are approaching to our village. Mamanga tells him to take all the villagers in a safe place and leave everything to me. As the knights appear, the head warrior Stranoff tells the chief that we are sent by king to eliminate the knights causing havoc in villages. Mamanga tells him don't worry I have already rescued this village and introduces himself. Stranoff dismounts from the horse and thanks him for saving villagers. Just then, one of his knight informs of unknown figures approaching this village, leading to a new challenge for Mamanga. In Kingdom of Slain Theocracy, Head Priest orders Captain Lewin to eliminate Stranoff, the strongest warrior of Riestai's kingdom, providing him with a powerful treasured item for assistance. Lewin then instructs his army to brace themselves for battle. They then arrive at the village to kill Stranoff. Mamanga asks, who are they? Stranoff tells, they are magic casters sent by Slain Theocracy. These were the one who earlier attacked villages as part of a plan to eliminate him. He expresses his desire to hire Mamanga for assistance to fight them, but Mamanga declines. He pleads for Mamanga to protect the village once more, but Mamanga stops him from bowing, stating there's no need to go that far, as he will save the village. Mamanga gives him a small sculpture-like gift before he heads out. On the way to battlefield he tells his soldiers, we'll attack the enemy head-on. 
cut open their bowels, and they all follow his lead. He first attacks with his arrow but is stopped by magic, so he heads on with his sword but his horse gets attacked, forcing him to fall back. Suddenly, an archangel comes to attack him. He forcefully slashes it with sword, but the archangel is unharmed and is ready to attack him once again. Stranoff uses martial arts and slashes archangel, making it vanish. Just then, he sees many archangels appearing, but he remains unwavering and ready to fight them. His army runs to fight the archangels but gets slaughtered because the enemy is more powerful, yet they still fight back. Stranoff realizes they are at a complete military disadvantage, so he looks for the main commander controlling the archangels, and runs to stop him, but all the archangels come to block his way. He attacks them with six-fold slash of light martial art. More archangels come to attack, and he uses an instant counter-attack, followed by flow acceleration, completely slashing through all the archangels. His army is amazed to see this, and even the enemy commander praises his martial art skills. However, he adds, Stranoff still can't win and summons the next set of archangels. As the enemy angels appear, he orders them to focus their attack on Stranoff, who is a bit exhausted but not ready to give up. Now, magic casters start attacking him with their spells, causing him to lose too much blood. Then all the archangels appear in front of him and run down to attack him. He fights with them, but due to his injuries, he's not able to precisely counter-attack them. One of the archangels attacks his abdomen, making him fall to the ground. The enemy captain orders them to finish him off. Just then, he says, don't underestimate me, and gets up with his sword, declaring, I'm the head warrior and I'll protect my country. Enemy captain says, but you are in a very terrible state. Once we finish you off, we'll massacre the villagers. Stranoff laughs, and the captain asks what's so funny. Stranoff tells him, you fool, there is someone stronger than me in the village. The captain thinks it's a bluff and orders the angels to kill the warrior. Stranoff is ready to fight back, but in next second, he teleports to a village storage house where villagers are hiding. The village chief tells him that Lord Ain suddenly disappeared as Stranoff appeared in his place. He takes out Mamonga's gift which vanishes soon, and he realizes everything. Meanwhile, Mamonga is teleported in front of the enemy in place of Stranoff. Enemy captain asks, who are you? Mamonga introduces himself as Ain's Ool Gown. The captain asks if he has come to beg for the lives of the villagers. Mamonga replies, actually, no. I came to ask you to offer your life to me without resistance because if you refuse, you'll have to die painfully. In response captain commands angels to attack, and they attack to his abdomen. Captain says, this happens when you bluff. But soon, he realizes that Mamonga is unharmed and is grabbing archangels with his hands. Mamonga explains he used high-tiered physical nullification which nullifies physical attacks of low-level weapons and monsters. He forcefully throws the archangels onto the ground, and they vanish in an instant. Mamonga then says, Now it's my turn, here I come, this is a massacre. The captain orders all the archangels to attack at once. Mamonga uses negative burst, creating a dark explosion that kills those monsters in a second. Luin then remembers, Stranoff warned them about someone stronger than him. All the enemy magic casters start shooting different spells at Mamonga as they are very scared of him. One caster tries to shoot a pebble at him and gets slashed off in an instant by Albedo. Mamonga tells her she should know that these aerial weapons would do no harm to him. But Albedo says these small pebbles should not be worthy to touch our Supreme Lord. Luin now tries to use their other strong monster called Principality of Observation to attack Mamonga. But as the angel attacks, it is stopped by him instantly. He uses his hellfire, and the angel gets wiped away in one hit. Enemies are scared and ask Luin what they should do. So he takes out the item he was given by the head priest, a sealing crystal with the ability to seal any magic other than the top tier spells. Mamonga prepares for this attack by asking Albedo to use her skill to protect him. Captain summons the strongest archangel, Dominion Authority, which looks very heavenly. Mamonga sees that this is their trump card and is speechless, but only because he was on guard for such child's play. Luin cannot fathom this and asks the angel to use Holy Smite, which is a 7th tier magic spell that in his words, no man can go against. A beam comes, Mamonga laughs and says so this is what it feels like to take damage. Albedo freaks out and says you low life how dare you cause pain to my master, you piece of trash. Mamonga asks her to calm down and says it's my turn now. He uses black hole and the angel disappears into a dark hole. Luin now starts begging for his life since he cannot win. Mamonger removes his mask and says if you fall quietly, I'll give you painless death, horrifying Luin. Later, as they head back to Nazarek, Albedo blushes saying Lord is freaking cool. She then expresses concern, admitting she was worried when he faced the angel's attack. Even though she knows he'll be unharmed, she can't tolerate any threat to someone she loves. He replies, I'll keep that in mind. Afterwards, Mamonga sits on his throne, apologizing for going alone. He mentions that Albedo will explain what happened. He then burns his flag and officially changes his name to Ain't's Gown. 
They all love the name and tell him how amazing he is. He gives them the absolute order to make the name Ain't Zool Gaon an eternal legend, hoping that his friends who have come in this world meet him as soon as they recognize him by this name. In the next scene, Albedo reads her daily report in front of Momonga. He then says, good work and she is pleased by his words. She says, please use me in any way you wish, my master. I love you so much. He then says I shouldn't have messed with your settings. Albedo leans closer to him and asks, does it cause trouble to you? And he replies, no that's not a case. She says, then it's fine, and starts imagining the day when she'll get married to Momonga. Just then, Shalter appears and greets him saying, I hope you are doing fine, my lord. He asks what brings you to my room today. She replies I'm here to lay my eyes on your exquisite form. Albedo says are you satisfied now? Then leave I'm discussing important matter with Ain Sama. So Shalter starts making fun of her and teases her. But when Albedo teases her back this enraged Shaltir and Albedo also gets angry they're ready to fight. But stops as soon as Mamanga scolds them. Shalter then tells I am leaving to join Sebas for the mission you asked for. Albedo smiles as Shalter will be away from Mamanga for some time at least. In the next scene, we see the fortress city of Erantal. People are enjoying themselves in the pub when someone opens the gate, drawing everyone's attention. It's Momonga, donned in his armor, accompanied by his maid, Nabral. As they approach the counter, everyone glare at them as they are newcomers. Momonga requests a room, and the manager demands seven bronze coins a night. Momonga pays, and a man guides them to their room. However, another man blocks their path. Momonga walks past him, brushing his leg, and the man picks a fight, saying, You hurt me. Now the woman with you will treat my injuries. Momonga grabs him by his collar and says, You're too weak to play around with, and throws the man away, breaking the table. And everyone is scared of Momonga. Woman cries in anger as her potion is broken when man hit her table. Momonga looks towards her, she approaches him, and blames that her potion is shattered because of him. This woman is an adventurer. She asks him to pay for the potion. He replies, why not of these guys compensate you for that? She says they don't seem to have enough money to pay for an expensive potion. Nabral is annoyed and about to attack, but Momonga stops her and gives the woman a red potion. Unfamiliar with the red potion, she examines it. Later, inside the room, Momonga makes his helmet disappear and asks Nabral, what do you think about humans? She says, they're trash. Momonga is shocked that like Albedo, she doesn't like humans but tells her to keep her hostility minimum towards humans. She says, I understood, my lord. He asks her to call him Maman instead of Ain Sama and to go by name to conceal their real identities. Mamanga explains their main objective is to go undercover as young adventurers to gain knowledge about the world and rank up. She says, amazing, as expected, Ain't Sama. He then tells her they aren't left with enough money here and can't use Nazarick's money without arousing suspicion. Meanwhile, the adventurer woman goes to the best pharmacist palace in the city. As she enters, she meets a boy named Enfira, the grandson of the pharmacist. She tells him, I'd like something appraised. Next we see Framacist is working. Her grandson calls her out and puts that red portion on her table. She says, let's check it, and with her magic, she starts appraising it. To their surprise, the red potion is a true potion of healing which no one should be able to make. She says it exhibit the color of God's blood, and is equal to worth 8 gold. Pharmacist warns, it's so rare that people might harm you if they find out about it, shocking the adventurer. The grandma then has a request for the adventurer. Next we see Erantal Adventurer's Guild. Momonga is standing in front of board filled with job flyers, searching for a suitable task. While others behind him talk about his amazing armor, and says he seems to be a rich dad's kid. This annoys Navarro again. Momonga looks at the flyers but can't understand the language. So he picks one randomly and asks for that job. The woman replies, sorry, we can't give you the job of a mithril plate adventurer. Momonga says, then give me a copper level job, as I have a copper badge. She agrees, and Momonga is happy that his trick worked to get a job, as he can't read language on the flyer. Just then, a few men appear and ask him to help them with their job. They all sit together, and the leader, Peter, introduces his group as the Swords of Darkness. Team members include, Luckert Volve, the eyes and ears of the team. Dine Woodunder, a druid in charge of healing magic and manipulation of nature. And Ninya, the magic caster and brains of the team. Luckert tells that Ninya is the famous talent holder and Mamanga asks what's that. Peter explains he has magic affinity talent, which is the ability to cut the required time to learn magic in half. Ninya says there is more famous talent holder than me. Momonga asks who's that and what kind of talent he has. They tell he's Enfira Balar, the grandson of famous pharmacist here. His talent allows him to use all magic items. Nabral says Enfira sounds dangerous human. Peter then explains their current job is to eliminate a monster near Erantal City. Momonga agrees to join them. He then tells them, as we'll be working together so I am showing you my face. They all look at him, Luckert comments, he's lot older than expected. 
After putting back his helmet Momonga says to himself, well this face is illusion. Lukrat then asks what kind of relation you two have and Momonga replies she's my ally. Hearing this he confesses his love for Nabe and asks her for a date. She says shut up you slug, know your place I'll cut your tongue. But he gets more attracted to her personality and says let's start with friendship. She says you want me to spoon your eyes. Peter knocks him for his friend's behavior and says sorry. Now they head down the stairs to leave for the mission. Just then they stop, as woman tells Momonga that he has been requested for a special job by and fire a Baylor. Nabe goes in front of him ready to attack if necessary but she gets karate chopped by Momon and told to not move without thinking. And Fyra introduces himself saying, I'm the one who requested you. Momonga says, I have a different job to do, sorry I can't help. Peter says, you must listen his request and then decide. And Momonga agrees. Afterwards and Fyra tells them, I'm going to collect the herbs near the Karn village forest, so I would like you to guard me. Momonga thinks this is troublesome, I don't really have a skill that protect a third party. So, he asks the members of Sword of Darkness group to help and they all are ready to assist him. Before continuing, he asks why you chose me, and then Fyra tells him that it was because he easily knocked over the man at the inn, and since he's a copper adventurer, it would be cheaper. Laman agrees, but he also has something in his mind. The scene shifts to the e Rantel communal cemetery. Someone in a cloak walks inside, opens a secret door leading somewhere, and walks down the stairs. Upon reaching there, she calls out to someone named Kajit. An old hag comes out and asks her, what do you want? She says, I brought this, and he responds, this is a crown of wisdom, a great treasure of the slain theocracy. She confesses to stealing it from a princess. The old hag says, it's a sacred item that seals the wearer's mind, turning them into an item that spews high-level magic. However, only one in a million people are compatible with this item. She confirms, mentioning hearing about a talent holder in town, who can use any magic item. She plans to make him wear the crown and use his abilities. She asks the old hag to help in creating chaos while she kidnaps him. Now, they all departed for their mission to take Enfira to the forest. Upon reaching halfway, Enfira suggests Peter to stop for a break. Peter informs Momonga and he agrees. As they all were resting, Peter then tells Momonga that from here onwards, it'll be dangerous, and Momonga says, okay, we'll be careful. Lukrat tells Nabe not to worry so much, saying, I'll protect you from every threat. This annoys Nabe, and she says, allow me to squash this mosquito, Mom and Sam. Her harshness made Lukrat fall for her even more. Ninya then asks this is area of wise king of forest right, and Enfira says yes, it's a magical creature with four legs and a tail of snake. Also, wise and capable of using magic. Laman finds it interesting and says he would like meet the creature. Meanwhile, inside the Nazarick tomb, we see Demiurge walking towards Mamunga's room. He knocks on the door and enters inside, where he sees Albedo lying on Mamunga's bed. He asks, what are you doing in Ain Sama's bedroom? She replies, I'm thinking of enveloping Ain Sama with my scent when he returns. Then she takes out something from inside the blanket, and Demiurge is surprised for a moment. He soon realizes it's a body pillow. Albedo replies, I made it myself and also knitting clothes for our future children. Demiurge says, it would be a pleasure to serve Lord Mamunga's heir as well. I hope that day will come soon. Back in the forest Mamunga is talking to Ninya and trying to learn more about this world. Lukrat tries to hit on Nabe again. And Nabe insults him again but Mamunga stops her. Lukrat says, aren't two of you lovers? Nabe cries out, what are you saying? while she blushes, about to reveal everything about Momonga, but he silences her. Momonga tells Lukrat to stop looking into their personal lives. Peter approaches and apologizes on behalf of Lukert. He then tells him to stop this, but suddenly Lukrat hears something. He tells them that enemies are approaching from that way. They see an army of goblins and ogres have reached there. Lukrat says, seems like we can't avoid fighting. Peter tells Enfira to remain hidden in the cart, and Nifira says, yes. Peter then asks Momonga what they should do, and Momonga tells them to protect Enfira and rest, I'll handle it. Peter says, we'll give you as much combat support as we can. He takes out his sword and says, I'll use martial art fortress to fight ogres. The monsters run towards them to attack. Lukrat shot an arrow on them but monsters laugh as it didn't reach them. They approach him, and Lukert says, they fell for it, while shooting a goblin. Dine uses his twin plant magic to trap the monster, while Ninya creates a magical armor to shield Peter, who's confronting the monster. Momonga and Nabe walk towards the monsters fearlessly. He takes out his blades from the back, and as monster comes to attack him, he dodges it and cut it with his sword, making it to fall at once. Everyone is amazed by Momonga's fighting skills. He then approaches others' monsters and asks aren't you gonna attack? One monster runs to attack him only to get sliced by Momonga's blade. This angers the monster's army and goblins run to fight them. Peter stopped them and starts fighting with monsters. A goblin who tries to attack Peter gets killed by Ninya's magic arrow. Others protect Ninya from the goblins who run in her direction to attack her. 
while two giant monsters are confronting Mamonga. One uses its weapon to attack, but he dodges and slices them off one by one instantly. Seeing this, the other tries to run with fear, so Mamonga orders Nabe to finish them off. Nabe flies near them and uses her lightning magic to attack the monsters, and they get killed instantly. The goblin army starts running from them to save their lives. And the next moment, we see defeated monsters, and Dain is healing his friends with magic. Wamonga sees Ninya cutting one of the monster's body parts and asks, What are you doing? Ninya explains, If you submit parts of the monster you defeat, the guild will reward you. Lamonga asks, so it's not like items like crystals dropping from them. Ninya says, I never heard of ogres carrying crystals. She then praises him, saying, you're more skilled than we expected. Dain says, you are as strong as the rumored royal head warrior. Mamonga also praises their team, you all are really strong altogether, and they all smile. At night, when they are all having dinner, Mamonga thinks, if I drink this, it'll leak through my bones. Nabe is also not eating, and Lucrat teases her, saying, if you don't like it, I can feed you mouth to mouth. She breaks the spoon with anger. Mamonga gives an excuse, saying, it's our religious teachings, we shouldn't eat with more than four on days we take a life, and then changes the topic, asking, why do you call yourselves the Sword of Dark? Peter explains that the name Sword of Darkness comes from the swords of one of the thirteen heroes. Nabe asks, who are they? Dinya explains, among the thirteen heroes, Sword of Darkness comprises four swords that the one called the Black Knight owned. Luckrat tells them, our ultimate goal is to find those swords. He then takes out the sword and says, until then, these represent the creation of our team. Dine, holding his sword, says, Luckrat said something surprisingly good. Peter takes out his sword too and says, this is our symbol, and Ninya smiles as she looks at her sword. While they are all talking with each other, Mamunger recalls his team who were like these. He adventured with them, collected material, and they helped him build Nazarek. Ninya then asks Mamunga if he was in a team, and he replies, Once, a white holy knight saved me, and he led me to people I could call comrades. I'll never forget the days I spent with them. Ninya says, I'm sure you'll find allies like them again. He replies, that day will never come, and walks away from there, and Nabe says, I'm also coming. Ninya feels bad for saying all this. Dine says, the people who have lost their comrades in battle give off an aura like this. Ninya thinks of herself, I know the pain of losing loved ones, seems like she's thinking about her older sister. And Fyra says, the strength Mom and San displayed today was amazing. Peter says, I believe Mom and San is royal head warrior level. And Fyra is amazed and says, that would mean he's at the same level as the strongest adventurers, and they all agree. They all start praising Mamonga because of his strength, and women easily get attracted to him. And Fyra feels a bit uneasy about it and asks, is Mom and San really that popular with women? Peter says, putting aside his looks, his strength is the real thing, and looking at his armor and sword, he must be wealthy. And Fyra doesn't know what to say. They ask him if there is any problem, and he tells them, in Karn village, there is a person I don't want falling in love with Mom and San. Luckrat says, I can teach you some techniques to get her, but Peter hits his head to stop him. They all then gather near Enfira and tell him, we'll support you if you'd like, and he blushes. Ninya still feels bad for Mamonga as she looks towards him. He is looking at the sky while Nabe is by his side. Meanwhile, Clementine is off finding information on Enfira's whereabouts. She kills everyone in her way, she slowly chases and terrifies a person. The person tells her, I don't know where Enfira is. She tells him that she loves killing and torturing people, which only makes him run away. Clementine stabs the person, and is able to mind control him with an ability after landing the hit. Now we so Kaj and he's still underground, he's creating zombies using his orb of death. We learn that he has been planning for years on turning the city of Erantel into a city of death by using a ritual called Spiral of Death. If he gets successful, he can become immortal. He says to Clementina if you cause any trouble, I'll kill you. She attacks him in that instant, but he uses his shield to protect himself. He says, such a foolish move and she replies I wasn't serious at all. They both seem to only be working together for mutual benefit. After she leaves, we get to know, she once held the ninth seat in the Black Scripture. Her power is that of hero class, and she carries a corrupt personality so she's really troublesome. In next scene, the group continue their journey. Momonger remembers that in the morning, Ninya apologized for bringing up his friends the night before, creating some awkwardness. Just then, Ninya talks about a dragon in the Azerlysia Mountains that can freely control the nature. Momonga breaks the ice by asking if she knows the dragon's name. She doesn't, but she agrees to find out when they get back to town. He says, okay, do it for me, and she smiles and agrees. The others also smile, happy to see Ninya and Mamonga getting along again. Once they are near the Karn village, they notice the fence surrounding the village. Seeing them approach, a goblin instructs another to go and call their leader. Once they reach there, goblin stops their way. Luckrat draws his weapon to shoot. The entire goblin army emerges, surrounding them from all sides. But goblin leader says we don't want to fight if we don't have to. This fully plated guy gives off a real dangerous feeling. 
Just then, a girl appears and asks what's happening. Upon seeing her, Enfira calls out her name. A big smile comes to Enri's face when she sees Enfira. Momonger recalls giving the horn to Enri earlier when he saved her from knights to summon the goblin army whenever she needed it. Enri is Enfira's friend. They go inside a house and she explain what happened in the village. Her parents were also killed. Enfira wants to comfort her and asks her about marrying because he loves her and wants to take responsibility. But he hesitates to share his feelings, and when she asks what's wrong, he nervously says, If you ever need my help, I'll always be there. She thanks him and feels lucky to have a friend like him. She then talks about how she summoned all those goblins from an item their savior, Ains Ulgaum, gave her. According to her, all the goblins are under her control and do what she says. Henry says she would like to meet Ains again, and Fyra freaks out about her wanted to meet someone else. But when she clarifies that she wants to meet him again to thank him, and Fyra feels relieved. Henry tells how he also gave her a red potion which healed her wound. While Enfira is remembering the red potion he saw earlier, Enri also tells that Ains was with someone with full armor, she even calls her by her name, Albedo. It doesn't take long for Enfira to put the pieces together and figure out that Mammon is actually Ains Ulgaum, the town's savior, and he's hero-class warrior. He reveals in his mind that he wanted to get close to such a person in order to find out more about the potion, so he hurries out and goes to find Mammon. Meanwhile, Mamunga and Nabe are on top of a hill. He's glad to see that villagers are learning to defend themselves, but Nabe thinks they're still weak. So, he explains to her that these people have never touched a bow, their loved ones were murdered, so they are working hard to ensure such a thing never happens again, we must admire them. Hearing this, Nabe says sorry, I didn't think that deeply about it. Just then, Enfira comes running towards Momonga to confirm his real identity. He asks, are you Ains Ulgaon? Momonga's silence confirms it. Although he doesn't know why Mammon is hiding his real identity, he decides not to ask and to thank him for saving Enri, the woman he loves. He then tells that I've been hiding something from you. Mamanga tells Nabe, can you leave us for a moment? As she leaves Enfira reveals that, I requested for you just to know more about the red potion you gave that lady, it's very rare and difficult to make. He apologizes Mamanga, who says you didn't do anything wrong. Your request was to just connect with me. But what will you do after knowing how the red potion is made? And Fire replies I just wants to gain knowledge. And Mamanga says if it isn't for any evil purpose then there is no problem with wanting to know. And Fire says you are amazing. Mamanga then asks, only you know I'm Ains and he says yes and assures that he won't reveal it to anyone. And after thanking him for everything, he leaves. Nabe comes and apologizes for almost revealing information about Mamanga and Albedo earlier, leading to Enfira realizing that Mamanga is Ains. She's about to take her life with sword as an apology but is stopped by Mamanga. He tells her to learn from her mistakes and she's forgiven. Afterwards, they are about to enter the forest and Enfira asks them to guard him well. He then requests Mamanga that if they happen to come across the wise king of the forest, he wants Mammon to send it away without killing. The reason is that it's the wise king of the forest's territory, and monsters don't come from the forest to attack the village. Mamanga agrees, while Lucrat is shocked to hear this because he thinks Mamanga can't defeat the legendary creature. Mamanga says, I want to do a survey of this area first along with Nabe. They both start their survey, and as they enter deep inside the forest, Nabe feels someone's presence and is about to attack but soon realizes it's Aura. Mamanga has summoned her to find the wise king of the forest and send the king to Mamanga. Aura leaves for the mission. She dashes off to find the wise king. A creature appears and puts her on its back along with another creature, which licks her face to show love. They both are her companions and don't want her to go alone. Afterwards they reach outside a cave. Aura slowly enters inside it and finds the monster sleeping soundly. She uses her magic blow to wake up the wise king of forest, and once it's awakened, she runs away from there. While collecting herbs and fire sees the birds flying away. Lucrat uses his ears and says something big is coming. Momonga and Nabe moves toward that direction saying, leave the rest to us and tell others to get out of forest. Then they both wait for the monster and Nabe takes out her sword, ready to fight. Just then, the monster arrives. It comes in their direction with speed. Mamanga takes out both his swords. Its eyes gleam, and it attacks Mamanga with its tail. But he stops it with his blades. Now, the monster praises him for blocking its attack but warns him to leave, or they will face punishment. Mamanga looks around but couldn't see the monster, so he makes fun of it, saying, Are you shy or lack confidence to show yourself? This enrages it, and it appears from behind the tree, a giant monster whose eyes gleam brightly. It says to Mamanga, I sense dismay and fear underneath your helm. Seeing it, Mamanga is not afraid at all. Instead, he asks, are you a Jungarian species of hamsters? They are large-sized hamsters with snake-like tail. 
The hamster is amazed at how Mamanga knows its species, and Mamanga explains, one of my old allies had a pet that looked like you. But in the next second, the hamster gets serious and says, let's stop this banter and fight for our lives. However, Mamanga didn't expect that the wise king of the forest is merely a hamster, and he says, it's a complete letdown. Though the hamster is serious about fighting, Mamanga feels it's useless to fight it. He uses the skill Aura of Despair on it, scaring the hamster, and it falls to the ground, surrendering itself. Aura asks, are you gonna kill him? I was thinking I'd want to skin him for hide. This scares the poor hamster even more. Afterwards, he brings the wise king of the forest outside and tells everyone, he's under my command now. Everyone is amazed to see it, and the hamster says, I'll do what my master will say. Ninya says, amazing, what a giant magical beast. Dine feels great wisdom and strength from it. Momonga is shocked to hear the praise for a mere hamster. He asks Nabe, what do you think? And she says, putting aside his strength, his eyes seem to gleam with power. Just then, Enfira asks Momonga, can I become a part of your team? I want to become stronger with you and protect and reincarn village. I'll do anything you want in exchange. Momonga says, so you want to get as strong as a magic caster? And Enfira replies, yes. Momonga then responds, sorry, you can't join my team. This upsets Enfira, but then he says, I can lend my strength to protect this village, and Enfira smiles, saying thank you. Now, they are back in the city and decide to part for a while. Boys head to Enfira's house to drop him and meet Mamanga later, while he takes the creature to register it first in the guild. On their way to guild, Mamanga feels embarrassed as everyone is staring at them. He is confused about whether he should feel proud to defeat the creature, it feels like an old man on a merry-go-round. Meanwhile, Enfira reaches his house. As he enters, he tells everyone to bring everything inside. He looks out for his grandmother, but welcomed by Clementine with a sinister look on her face. She then says, you didn't come home for days, I've been waiting the whole time. Enfira asks, who are you? She replies, I'm here to kidnap you. Hearing this, the boys run to protect Enfira. Clementine reveals that she wants to use Enfira as a tool to summon the army of undead. The boys are on their guard when she tells them her sinister plan. She says, I will bring chaos by summoning an army of undead and lead them in different directions. Isn't it the perfect plan? Enfira startles at this and the lantern falls from his hand. Peter tells Enfira to run and Lukert tells Ninja to take Enfira away. Clementine draws out her sword and says, it's impossible to run in my presence. Just then, Kajit enters and says, don't play around too much. She replies, it won't take much time as she licks her sword. Everyone is in a cold sweat due to her threatening presence. Meanwhile, Momonga comes out after registering the hamster in the guild and sits on it, naming it Hamusuk. Hamusuk thanks him, calling him master. People are amazed that the creature is talking and can't believe that Momonga is a mere copper plate warrior. And Fira's grandmother sees him and approaches, asking if he went with her grandson to collect herbs. Momonga says yes as his bodyguard. The woman then asks if this hamster is wise king of the forest, and hamster makes a proud face while Momonga confirms it. The woman then asks where her grandson is, he says he went ahead with herbs, and I'm going to meet him now for my reward to accompany him. She says okay, you can come with me. As they reach home, she calls out for Enfira, but he's not there. Mamanga senses danger, he takes out his sword and walks towards the inner door. He opens it and walks inside, finding out members of the darkness sword lying dead on the ground. The woman is shocked as they all are murdered. Just then, they get up in zombified form and are about to attack but Momonga quickly slices them off. Next, zombified Dine tries to attack, but Momonga stops him too. The woman panics, asking where is Nifira and runs to find him, while Momonga stands between the dead bodies of his allies. He then orders Nave to protect the old woman and finds Ninya lying on the ground. He checks her, she is killed brutally. He says, this is displeasing, whoever did this, I'll not leave them. After checking the bodies and surroundings, he concludes that their goal was to take Enfira since nothing else seemed to be stolen. The woman asks who are these dead people, Mamanga tells her these were the people who helped me guard your grandson on the way to collect herbs. He then tells the woman if you'll make a request to me, I can bring back your grandson, but I'm very expensive. She asks how much you want, and he says everything you own. She says, are you a demon? And describes this interchange as making a deal with a demon in exchange for her soul. She doesn't care though, and says, I just want my grandson back. He then plans to track down the location of Enfira through the map. Just then, he gets a call from his maid to contact Albedo when he gets free. Getting back to plan he retrieves a magical bag and takes out a scroll from it, tossing it to Nabe. He tells her, you already know what I want. She says, understood, master. He then starts taking out more scrolls one by one. After putting some scrolls on the map, he asks Nabe to activate them. Nabe takes them one by one and starts activating them using her magic. 
These scrolls will help them track Enfira and protect them later from enemies. Scrolls fly off and vanish as they get activated. After she finishes using the scrolls, she pinpoints the location to be the cemetery. And in Momonga's order, she then picks two more scrolls and activates them to be able to see the location. They see a pack of undead with Enfira in between. Nabe says, should we teleport there and attack at once? Momonga replies, that will be foolish, they are trying to do something big as they've prepared a huge number of undead. He says, I have a plan and walks towards the door where Enfira's grandma is waiting. He tells her that Enfira is in the cemetery, along with an army of dead, we are heading there. Please inform townspeople and the guild, an army of the dead may pour out of the cemetery. She says, do you have a way to defeat the army of dead? And Momonga replies, yes, it's me. Now the scene shifts to the area of the cemetery, where soldiers are guarding the premises. Just when a soldier comments on another quiet night, they suddenly hear a noise. Another points in a direction, saying, look over there. An army of the dead is approaching in their direction. Their leader says, our numbers are too low compared to this army of the dead, and orders to notify other soldiers to come for help. The army of undead reaches the gate and surrounding wall, attempting to enter. One undead starts climbing, and a soldier pushes it back. However, their numbers are too large, and they start coming one after the other. One soldier is about to get killed, but his comrade saves him by pushing away undead on time. One of them starts slashing their heads. Soldiers try to stop them, but suddenly so many undead climb up, forcing the soldiers to retreat. Just then, Momonga appears with his pet hamster. Seeing his plate, a soldier says, copper plate is useless against undead. Momonga jumps down and asks Nabe for his sword. As a large undead monster appears, Momonga says to the soldier, look behind, and then throws his sword at the monster with speed, making it fall at once. He then asks them to open the gate, but they refuse, doubting Momonga's skills against the whole army of undead. So, he just flies off to the other side, and Nabe and then hamster also follow him. In the next moments, soldiers are shocked to see the army of undead has fallen and recognize Momonga as the legend who defeated the whole undead army by himself. Now, we see Momonga making his way to the cemetery by slashing away the undead one by one, using his blade swiftly to kill them. While Nabe and Hamusuk are in the air following him, Hamusuk feels bad to follow as he's the burden Nabe has to carry since he can't fly, and on the ground, he can be attacked by undead. Momonga suddenly stops and realizes that at this rate, they can't reach the crematory because the number of undead is high, and they keep on attacking while he slashes them off. Nabe asks him why don't we do it the easy way, why not send in forces with undercover skills, sit back, and wait for a shift in the situation, that would give us the best timing. Momonga, shocked that he didn't think of it, dismisses this and tells her that she'll never learn if he has to explain everything all the time. He then creates middle-tier undead corpse collector and Jack the Ripper, ordering them to fight undead, and they start clearing Momonga's way to pass faster. They leave Hamisuk on top of the tree where undeads can't reach, while they head to the crematory. There, we see Kajit with his disciple trying to perform some ritual. Momonga calls him, asking why he's wasting his night in a boring ritual. Kajit asks who he is, and Momonga first says, Tell me where Enfira is and the person who killed my companions. Before Kajit could say anything, we hear a voice, it's Clementine who admits that she killed his companions. She smiles, saying, So you are here to fight me? Well, that's interesting. Momonga tells Nabe, I'll leave Kajit to you, and I'll take care of Clementine. He then asks Clementine, why don't we fight over there? She says, okay, and walks away with him. As they leave, Nabe uses her twin maximize magic and attacks Kajit and his disciples. In the next moment, all the disciples are dead except Kajit. Meanwhile, Clementine asks Momonga, are you mad that I killed your allies? She laughs and says, it was fun, sorry for killing them. He replies, no need to apologize, and she says, that's boring, you aren't mad. Maybe they were not your friends. Momonga responds, your very existence is offensive. I'll give you a handicap. He laughs and says that someone who has stepped into the domain of hero territory would never lose. Momonga says, I am gonna give you handicap but I won't fight you seriously. Back to Kajit, he tells Nabe, you're leaping into the land of the dead without understanding the strength of the strong. He then activates the orb and Nabe recalls Momonga's warning to be cautious above her. To her surprise, a colossal dragon known as the Skeletal Dragon appears above her. But before it could attack her, she evades. The dragon flies of an opposite direction and lands on the ground. The dragon gives a big roar and Kajit laughs, saying, The dragon is resistant to magic, and as a magic caster, you can't fight against it. This annoys Nabe. She takes out her sword and gets ready to fight, saying if that's the case, I'll beat it to death. She then runs in the direction of dragon and before it could harm her she jumps and attack it with her sword. 
making the dragon fall in one single hit. Kajit is surprised by this and asks, who are you? She responds by saying, you red click beetle, how dare you to underestimate me? Kajit gets mad and uses ray of negative energy, which seems to have regenerated the dragon and as if it weren't enough he uses, reinforce armor, lesser strength, shield wall, and undead flame to make the dragon stronger. She in turn, uses reinforce armor, shield wall, protection energy negative to strengthen herself. As the dragon approaches to attack her, she charges at the monster and blocks its attack. This annoys Kajit as she seems to be very strong. As she falls back on the ground, he attacks with acid javelin, shooting acid, but her defensive magic dodges it. She attacks Kajit with lightning, but the dragon blocks it with its leg. Kajit once again uses his jewel to summon another skeletal dragon, which comes out from inside the ground. Having summoned another, he has used up all the negative energy he's collected but believes that once he kills Nabe, Mamanga, and the city, he'll regain it. Seeing this, Nabe dashes towards the dragons to fight them. As she gets closer, one monster attacks and stomps on her. Kajit smiles at this but soon realizes that she has blocked the hit, and then throws back the dragon. Kajit is a bit scared and asks her, who are you, and how do you have such physical strength? She tells him, I was created by a supreme being that even surpasses the gods. Meanwhile, Clementine and Mamanga are fighting with each other. She stops and says, are you an idiot? You're just a meathead swinging around a sword. Mamanga retorts, you were just evading my attacks this whole time. What happened to your confidence that can beat any warrior? Hearing this, she takes out her sword and is about to charge towards Mamanga, but just then, they hear the dragon's roar. Mamanga says, that's the skeletal dragon, right? Clementine confirms, correct, and magic doesn't work on it, the worst enemy of a magic caster, making Mamanga realize that Nabe can't win against it. He challenges Clementine to an actual fight. She removes her cloak, gives a sinister smile, and charges at him very fast, dodging a hit and using impenetrable fortress. Momonga is knocked back a bit. She tries to stab him, but his armor is really hard and it doesn't do much. She then thinks of hitting in an area where the armor is thinner. She lunges at him once again, using impenetrable fortress to block a hit, and then flow acceleration to dodge his next attack. She aims for his eyes, but it looks like he didn't take any damage. She then licks her sword, wondering if he used martial art defense as he didn't take damage with her attack. Momonga replies that he learned more about martial art from her but now enough playing around. He shouts loudly so his voice reaches Nabe, ordering her to show Kajit the real power of Nazarek. He puts his sword down and tells Clementine to attack him fully prepared to die. Meanwhile, Nabe seems a bit tired, and Kajit tells her if you surrender, I might spare you. This enrages her, and she replies, don't be cocky, you trash, angering him, and he orders the skeletal dragon to crush her. Just then, Mamanga's voice reaches her, ordering her to show them the power of Nazarek. She smiles and says, as you wish, master. Just then, the dragon dashes towards her to attack, but she uses teleportation and appears from above and then uses the ability to fly to float in the air. Kajit wonders where did she go, but then he spots her. He is shocked that she can even use fly magic and wonders if she has a chance of winning against complete magic resistance. Narbrol now changes into her maid form and presents herself as one of the play and battle mates. Seeing this, Kajit orders the dragons to attack, but she teleports again and stabs him on his shoulder from the back, asking, does it hurt? She then teleports back. Kajit thinks of this as her trump card, but she was just showing him that she can kill him whenever she wants. She thinks it's rude to make ants wait, so she decides to end it. She uses twin maximize magic, chain dragon lightning, teaching him that his dragons can die if the magic is stronger than 6th tier, as dragons can only nullify magic below than 6th tier. Kajit is in cold sweat but boldly replies, Baka, no human in this world can use magic above 6th tier. But her smile tells everything. She then releases the magic to attack, and both dragons vanish in seconds. Heavy lightning falls on Kajit, turning him into dirt. Meanwhile, on the other side, Mamon and Clementine are still at a stand. Clementine is a bit mad that he's not taking her seriously and mocks at him. Mamanga says, when the weak rave this much, it's impressive. She uses stride of wind, greater evasion, ability boost, and greater ability boost and dashes towards him. She manages to hit him inside his helmet in his eyes and uses lightning. She uses her other sword and uses fire, saying, I'm not finished yet. But just at that moment, he grabs her tightly. As the fire vanishes, she wonders why he's not dead yet. He reveals his face and she's shocked to see that he's undead. He says, you are right, and reminds her how she killed his comrades. She cries out in anger, don't underestimate me. He says, that's why I want to give you a handicap, you aren't a worthy opponent to fight seriously. She is really mad but cannot escape. He's holding on to her really hard and keeps on taunting her. 
He begins to squeeze and squeeze while taking his time, and she's trying to fight back as much as possible. She kicks and hits and head slams. He then grabs her with his other hand, and soon she dies. Momonga then walks away, but Hamusu comes running towards him, but Nabe appears and stops him, calling him a fool. Momonga tells Narbrol to take their things before the others arrive and to leave only their bodies for the people who come. He then enters a place where Anfira has been kept, his eyes were taken away, and his mind was controlled. Momonga decides to cure his eyes. He first destroys the crown of wisdom in his head, which was controlling him, and Anfira falls as he's unconscious. He brings him out where Nabe and Hamisuk are waiting for him. They both then follow Momonga as they leave from there. Now, we are in the city of Erantel, inside a hotel. We see a lady complaining about the food to her butler whom we recognize as Sebas, one of Momonga's servants. As the lady storms off, she commands a man named Zack to prepare her carriage immediately. She doesn't want to stay in the town any longer and then walks towards her room. Afterward, Sebas follows her and knocks on the door. As he enters, she calls him Master Sebas and also apologizes for her rudeness. He says there's no need to apologize as they're on a mission, and he's currently acting as her butler. We learn that she's one of the maids of Momonga, and Sebas is her head. Shaltir is also included in their mission. He then picks up his suitcase and asks her about that man Zack. She uses her eyes and ears, one of her abilities, to check on Zack, who is planning to attack them. This lady is a bit weird and asks if she can keep Zack afterward for her enjoyment while having a scary look on her face. Afterwards, we see Zack driving the carriage and signaling the others, with the lamp to come. Meanwhile, Shaltier is in a carriage along with Sebas and the lady, waiting for Zack to attack and talking with each other. Sebas asks Shaltier why she and Aura don't seem to get along, and she explains that Aura and her creators are real-life siblings, and Pera and Sino built Shaltir to tease Aura, just like siblings do in real life, which amazes Sebas. Suddenly they stop and are told to get out of the carriage by Zack and his men outside. Shaltir comes out first and gives a smile. A man tries to touch her, but she calmly cuts his arm and kills him for wanting to touch her. She then jumps out, and everyone is scared to see this. When he dies, his blood comes out and forms an orb of sorts. She says this is boring and sends her vampire ladies to kill the others. Zack is scared as vampires kill his men. Just then, the lady appears from behind and lures him. As he tries to grope her, she pulls him inside her and devours him, smiling as if she's having fun. After they kill everyone, Shaltir is disappointed that they weren't able to catch anyone good this time. One of her vampires reports about a man named Brian who is good at martial arts and can engage in equal combat with head warrior, Stranoff. Then Sebas tells Shaltir that he is going to collect the information in the capital, with Lady. So they must leave, leaving Shaltir and the vampires to go for Brain. The scene shifts to the cave where a blue-haired man takes out his sword upon hearing commotion and walks toward that direction. One of his men comes running to him. He informed him that there are two women killing people there. Brain tells the man to go and fortify their defenses while he goes to deal with them. Meanwhile, Shaltir is walking through the cave, killing men, but she's bored because they are nothing compared to her. Brain comes out and cuts Shaltir's vampire, but her wounds heal instantly. Shaltir asks Brain, are you alone? I don't mind you calling all of your friends. He says that he doesn't need them since they will just get in his way. The vampire tries to go for Brain but is pushed into a wall by Shaltir, who says, now it's my turn. Brain now introduces himself as Brain Unglaus and asks for her name. She gracefully says, Shaltir Bloodfallen, and I hope you'll entertain me well. Brain notices that she is arrogant and thinks she is unbeatable, so he prepares an attack. He brings attention to the speed of his god blade attack, god flash, an absolute area of perception, field, and believes it could be enough for the fight. Rings appear around him, and Shaltir asks, are you done with preparation? Then I shall begin to trample you. She walks into his range, and he uses Whistling Wind, a move he was saving for Stranoff, to try to kill her. But as he attacks her, she easily blocks his attack, making him frightened, and he calls her a monster. She says, now you have realized I'm the cold but beautiful little monster. She falls back and looks at Brain, asking him, could it be you can't use your martial arts? You don't seem to be strong. This angers him, and he jumps in her direction to attack her. He keeps attacking, but she stops them with her fingers only. Soon he gets tired, and she says sorry to him and asks, did you use martial arts just now? I notice a change in your strength. He trembles in fear and starts crying. She says, don't worry, I won't kill you. You're useful for my master. Brain realizes he was a fool and runs away screaming. Shalter lets him run a bit and then uses her orb to transform, presumably to chase him. Some men are hiding to attack Shaltir, but just then they see Brain comes running, but he won't stop to explain to others and runs inside a room. 
Shalter comes out in her monstrous form, which is very scary. A man attacks her to stop her, but it won't work. He orders his men to shoot. She jumps in their direction and attacks one of the men, devouring him and sucking his blood. A man tries to run, but when he looks back, all his comrades are dead. Just then, Shalter jumps to attack him and finish him, and she goes to look for Brain, who has escaped through a hole. She's mad that he escaped. Just then, one of her vampires comes and tells her that some men are heading their way. She goes outside and sees a group of men standing, ready to fight her. She screams out loudly, and the red-haired girl from before is also among them. The mage in the group tells them to prepare their silver weapons, as he believes the monster to be a vampire. Shaltir struggles between capturing, as she was instructed, and the urge to kill them. She says, I want to tear them apart and bathe in their blood. Meanwhile, they prepare their weapons with silver. Shaltir lunges at them and kills some men. The red-haired girl confronts her to fight, and Shaltir laughs, saying, You are cute, leaving the red-haired girl last for her dessert, and goes to attack the rest of the men, killing them one by one. Now she turns to attack the girl, who is very much scared of her. The girl takes out the red potion. Shaltir is shocked at first, and as the girl throws the potion, Shaltir breaks it and stands still for a second, and the girl runs. She looks at the potion and realizes something. She commands her vampires to capture her alive, and they capture her in no time. Shaltir approaches her and says, look in my eyes. She uses her visual powers to command her to tell her where she acquired the red potion from. The girl informs her that she received it from a black armored man at an inn in E-Rantle. Shalter knows that this man is Mamonga but doesn't know why he gave her that potion assuming he must be creating friendly relationships for some reason. Shalter then asks her why she was there. The girl tells that they were searching for the base of a soldier turned mercenary. Something seemed off, so they split the team, and a ranger stationed a bit further away just in case. Shalter figures out that when the noise must have made the ranger run. She runs and jumps on the tree, mad while looking out for them, saying, I have let two people escape. She can't see anyone and summons her children, wolf-like creatures, to run and find them and kill anyone they find in the forest. While she's sulking, she sees that her children were killed and angrily goes towards that location in her scary form. Her vision is blurry and red, but she sees a group of people, and she can already tell that one in particular is strong. That person immediately tells someone named Lady Care to use it. Shaltir makes a weapon from her blood orb and pushes the strong person away. As someone else comes to block her path, Shaltir is hit by some magic and, before it can take full effect, she throws a javelin-like ability, hitting two people, Lady Care, and a man protecting her. Shaltir stops moving, and in the next second, Albedo tells, Shaltir Bloodfallen has revolted against us. The vampire brides who were with Shaltir have both died, and after Shaltir does not respond to Albedo's calls, Albedo notices that her name is red. Since her name is not erased, she's not dead. Momonga deduces that enemies have used mind control and have possibly turned Shaltir into their enemy. He thinks, how could it be possible? Shaltir is undead, she has a skill to nullify mind control. Albedo suggests sending a hunting party comprised of her as the commander and Cossidus and Mare as vice commanders to kill Shaltir, as she revolted against them because she was told not to kill anyone. But Mamonga wants to confirm why Shaltir has revolted first. If this can happen to other NPCs as well, he wants to find out how it happened and if there is a way to counter it, or Nazarick might crumble. Mamonga wonders if Shaltir chose this path because he might not have treated her well. Albedo disagrees, thinking it's unlikely since they all seem to love Mamonga and the other creators. Mamonga understands that if they had free will, Shaltir could have made this choice. He tells Albedo that he loves all of them and just wants to understand. Albedo is excited at the thought that Mamonga loves her, but he clarifies that he loves all his servants. Albedo then asks, but you also love me master, right? As he confirms, she becomes even happier. Meanwhile, Shaltir is standing in her position, unconscious. In the next scene, we see Ain't sitting on his throne and is checking the situation of Shaltir. Suddenly, he gets a call from Narbrol. With her bunny ear connecting device, she informs him that leader of the Adventurer's Guild has sent a message for him to go to the guild immediately to discuss the vampire that has recently appeared near Erantel. Now, Momonga has arrived at the guild and is talking with guild members. Ainsach, the leader of the guild, tells them the whole incident of the vampire appearance and how it killed so many people. While everyone listens carefully, Momonga realizes they are talking about Shalter only. The leader then says they will send the scouting party there to check where the vampire was spotted and conclude that it's related to recent cemetery case, believing Kajit's comrades would have done this. Momonga intervenes and says it's not related to it because he knows that vampire, her name is Haniopnioko, is someone he has been chasing for a long time. 
He knows her, so he will send his scouting party to kill the vampire if she is there. Leader asks, are you sure you'll be able to do that? Momonger replies although she's strong. He has a trump card, which is a magic sealing crystal that contains 8 tier magic. Leader agrees and asks what reward you want for this. Momonga asks to be Orichalcum level of warrior at the very least. Hearing this, Igvarge demands to go as well since he doesn't trust Momonga. Momonga agrees but warns him, if you come along, you'll definitely die. Seconds after this, we are now in a forest. Momonga is along with his team, watching Igvarge cussing them. His team is killed by them, and he's also tied to a tree. Momonga tells him, I warned you, but you didn't listen. Mare then approaches him and smacks him on the head with her weapon, and he dies. Momonga then orders them to take the dead bodies back to Nazarick for experimentation. He tells Narbrol and Hamusuk to go back to Nazarick as well. Hamusuk says, If I will be okay without you, master. Nabrol replies, You're our master's pet. Nobody is going to kill you without his permission. Momonga now leaves with Albedo to check on Shaltir. They arrive at the location where Shaltir is. Albedo tries to approach her, but Momonga stops her. He realizes that she's under mind control. He tells Albedo, we should nullify her mind control quickly as he shows his ring named Shooting Star, a rare item to nullify the effect of mind control. Albedo asks if its effect is higher than 10 tier magic, and Momonga says yes. Momonga uses the ring and orders it to cure all of Shaltir's status effects. Albedo is impressed by him using such an important item for a servant like Shaltir, and calls him a compassionate master. As the ring activates, a magic circle forms and is promptly destroyed. He's shocked to see that super tier magic didn't work. He looks at Shaltir and thinks that such a type of power exists in this world that super tier magic didn't work on it. He tells Albedo to come closer and they are withdrawing quickly and leave. They teleport far away and Albedo blushes in the arms of Mamunga. He starts kicking the ground. Albedo is worried for him and asks him what happened. He apologizes to her and tells her that the only thing that super tier magic cannot beat is a world item. The enemy used it against Shaltir. He orders Albedo to raise the security level of Nazarick to the maximum and to call back all the guardians that are away. Now, we see Cossidus ordering servants to follow Mamunga's order, with Demurge meticulously inspecting every floor of Nazarick, and Mare keeps an eye on the area surrounding Nazarick. Meanwhile, Sebas and Solution are still on their mission. Solution asks Sebas if they should also return to Nazarick as well, but Sebas tells her that they have been ordered to continue their mission. She then says, I can't believe Shaltir revolted. Sebas replies, our master is a man of greatness, he'll handle her situation. In the next scene, we see Mamanga teleported to the treasury room along with Albedo and a maid. This is the first time for Albedo in the treasury, as she mentions that it cannot be entered without the Ring of Ain's Ul Gown, her master's ring. Mamanga walks towards a door where words appear, he reads them, and the barrier opens. From there, they head towards the mausoleum to meet Pandora's actor, the guardian of the treasury, created by Mamanga himself. Albedo states that he's responsible for their treasury. As they reach the mausoleum, Albedo is shocked to see Tabula Sama, one of the supreme beings like Mamanga and is Albedo's creator. She questions his identity as she knows he can't be Tabula, and the creature couldn't understand her behavior. She orders the maid to kill him. Ains tells the creature it's enough, and it comes back to its real form, Pandora actor. He welcomes them, salutes his creator Mamonga, and asks him about his visit here. Mamonga replies, I've come here for some world items. Pandora actor acts in a weird way after hearing this, Albedo and the maid couldn't understand his cringe behavior as he speaks about world items. Mamonga is shocked that Pandora actor is acting so lame. He tells him the names of some world items he wants and also informs him that his name is now Ains Ulgaon and not Mamanga. Pandora actor starts acting weird again, Albedo and the maid look at him with cold eyes. Ains created him thinking he'd look cool, but regrets it now. They move further and Pandora salutes them, calling the women ladies, which offends them. Albedo tells him not to use such a light word for them. Just then, Mamanga takes him to the side and tells him to stop acting like this, it looks weird. Pandora's actor replies in German, and Ains angrily asks him not to do that either. Ains finds this more embarrassing than the time he rode the hamster Hamusuk. Ains goes back and asks Albedo to give her ring to Yuri. It seems like she doesn't want to give it up, but she has to. As they enter, he explains that if they go further in, the golems will attack anyone who doesn't have the ring. The golems in this room all look like supreme beings who have left and were Mamunga's comrades. He looks at the golems of his comrades and mentions that they gave their equipment to him after they retired from the game. Although they were okay if Ains sold the items, he kept them around in case they ever come back. Albedo is sad for him, upon seeing him sad that his comrades left. When Ains asks what happened, she says, nothing. 
Ains continues by saying that there is an empty spot where he plans to put a statue of himself. Upon hearing this, Albedo cries and begs him, Please rule over us forever, Ains Sama, bowing her head down as she cries. Ains holds her, wipes her tears, and asks for her forgiveness. Albedo says, Please promise me you'll stay forever. He can't promise that he'll stay with them forever, and Albedo continues to beg. He then holds her and explains the problem they are facing right now. Enemies have controlled Shaltir's mind with a world item. So, in order to defend themselves, they have to wield a world item as well. That's why they came here to obtain them. He tells her that there is a way to save Shaltir and that he plans to fight her by himself and doesn't know if he'll come back. With teary eyes, Albedo asks, Why do you want to fight her all alone when you have a full army of servants who can fight along with you? He replies that there is a high chance that going there and fighting Shaltir may be a trap. She may be used as bait. He doesn't want to lose his servants in this, as they don't know the enemy well. Albedo wants to go, but he tells her that he's the only one who may be able to beat her in a one versus one. Albedo feels sad but tells him that she will not stop him on the promise that he will return. He promises he'll defeat Shaltir and return to Nazarick. And Albedo smiles. Ains uses the gate, and he, along with Aura and Mare, arrives at a cliff outside. He orders them to begin scouting the area for enemies, and they both say, yes, master. He then thinks, where is the owner of the world item that's controlling Shaltir? Why isn't he here? Meanwhile, Albedo and Cossidus are sitting and watching Ains, when Demiurge also appears. He sits down and asks, why did you allow Ains Sama to go alone? Albedo replies, it was his decision, we must obey. Demiurge gets angry and says, even if it was his decision, Letting him go alone is dangerous to his life. Albedo calmly tells him, Ain't Sama promised me that he'll come back to Nazarick after defeating Shaltir, and I believe in his words. Demiurge gets angrier and says, You're just saying all this in emotions. He decides to go assist his master. As he tries to leave, he's blocked by Cossidus. He asks, What will you do if something happens to our lord? Let me go. She boldly replies, Just believe in your master, he'll return. Demerge reluctantly sits down, and they plan to see if Ains will beat the odds and win victoriously. Ains is still walking through the forest, and he promises to destroy whoever did this to Shaltir. Once he reaches where Shaltir is, we get to know his plan, which is to resurrect Shaltir once he kills her. But he knows that this is a big gamble since he's not sure if it will even work. Ains first uses the body of a fulgent barrel to see if this will trigger Shaltir to attack. It doesn't since it isn't an actual attack. Before going for an actual attack, he starts preparing himself by using Bless of Magic Caster, Great Magic, Triple Maximize Magic, Draconic Power, Sensor Boost, and other things needed. He charges a super tier magic spell that surpasses 10th tier magic, while Albedo is watching him along with Demiurge and Cossidus. Ains thinks, still, no enemy appeared, or are they still watching? He then takes out his wristband and wears it. Lastly, he takes out the six different sticks and puts them on his belt one by one. As he's now ready to fight, he uses his super tier magic, Fallen Down, which causes a huge explosion, and the surrounding area clears for the fight. After the smoke clears, Shaltir is still standing and starts laughing. She says, It's wonderful that I have to kill such a powerful man like Ains Sama. Ains asks, Why do you still address me as Sama? She replies that a supreme being such as himself can only be addressed as Ains Sama. Ains then asks her who her master is now. Shaltir stops for a second to ask herself why she's fighting Ains but can only remember that she must use all her strength to counter and destroy if she's attacked. She charges towards him, but as she moves further, an explosion occurs because of mines placed by Ains. Ains apologizes to her for doing this to her. He then uses Gravity Maelstrom, throwing a spiral ball at Shaltir, but she uses Wall of Stone to block his attack. He immediately uses Maximize Magic, Hold of Rib and Bones, which come out and hold her in. However, she quickly flies up. Ains warns her that he has prepared various traps in this area and suggests she flap her wings over him. She replies, I won't fall for your trap, Ain't Sama. She comes down and thinks that to fight Ain't Sama in close combat, she should have to extinguish his MP, as Ains's strength as a magic caster only exists with MP. Shalter uses Mana Essence to see how much MP he has left but, as she feared, he still has so much. She's also annoyed that he isn't wearing his usual god-level items to fight. Before starting to fight again, Shalter uses Regenerate to heal a bit. Ains won't allow for this, so he uses Gravity Maelstrom to stop her. Shalter uses Greater Teleportation to escape the attack, but Ains's Delay Teleportation kicks in, and he uses Drifting Mastermind to explode her. She manages to avoid it, but Ains uses Astral Smite. He shoots them in her direction and manages to hit her, and she moves towards the ground. He uses Thousand Bone Lance and shoots to attack her, but she escapes with teleportation. He immediately attacks her again, but she shields herself before getting hit. Ains is surprised as he has never seen her use this skill before. She laughs and says, I wonder how long you can play through. She then presents her purifying javelin and throws it to attack him. 
The ability locks onto him and hits ants in his chest. It's a holy element weapon that's very effective against any magic user. She again attacks him with it. Ains says, don't underestimate, and uses reality slash, causing great damage, but she recovers immediately. Ains is amazed by this recovery skill. She taunts him, saying Perorancino Sama gave this skill to her, and this is proof that Perorancino is superior to Ains. Ains boldly replies, no matter what skills you have, my magic is superior to yours. She brings out her magical javelin, saying, if so, I won't lose. Ains uses his reality slash again, while she throws her javelin at him, and both take damage. Shalter checks his MP, and it's a lot lower now, while she still has MP. Ains uses Call Greater Thunder, while Shalter uses Vermilion Nova. Her ability burns him, while his ability shocks her. She notices her fire ability didn't really work and says, Looks like you have taken measures against fire. Ains replies, Compensating for your weakness is part of the basics. He then uses Maximize Magic, True Dark, while she uses Maximize Magic, Brilliant Radiance. Both take damage, but she smiles as she notices that this time Ains gets affected, revealing his weakness to holy damage. Demiurge is shocked and asks Cossidus, what's the meaning of this? Cossidus explains that his robe only focuses on protection against fire. After a bit more fighting, Shalter sees that Ain still far surpasses her in the battle of magic, even with her holy damage, but she's happy that she was able to lower his MP quite a bit. He uses some defense magic for protection, so Shalter now decides to attack him physically. As she's preparing to attack, Ain says, this is a disadvantageous fight for me, and Shalter says, why don't you retreat? Ains replies, I won't run from my duties as a guild leader. They continue the battle, and she sprouts some wings and uses summon household to summon bats. Ains uses shark cyclone to counter her bats, and she appears from the ability, dodging one of his attacks and piercing him in the chest. Shalter drains him a bit, and Ains activates his body of effulgent, managing to vanish a bit away from the attack and countering with wall of skeleton to protect himself. Shalter uses force explosion to blow it up, and when she blows up a hole in the wall, Ains then releases greater magic seal. The attack shoots out arrows that follow her and manage to hit her. She then uses magic destruction to deflect the remaining arrows and flies to him, pushing him away. Ains uses fly to try and gain control. He sees that she's recovered a bit and uses his reality slash a couple of times as she's flying to him, one of them hits her. She uses negative impact shield again and pushes him to the ground. She comes down and uses her final trump card, Einerjar, which creates a white clone of herself. She uses Summon Household once more, but this time many more creatures appear. Ain starts thinking of ways to deal with them, but Einerjar doesn't give him time to think and starts attacking him as Shalter starts healing off from her own monsters by killing them. Ains avoids the clone a bit and then uses his skill the goal of all life is death and then widen magic to increase the range of his cry of the banshee as a magic clock appears behind him. Calm down starts while the clone is still attacking him and the calm down ends as magic activates. He says, it's the end and everything vanishes around him, creating an area of sand. All that is left is Ains, Shaltier and a lot of sand. Shalter explains that she was resurrected by the item Perorancino Sama left her. Shalter start moving towards Ains because he has less MP than her, and she thinks she'll win. She asks, do you have any last words? Ains responds, if you had fought cautiously, I wouldn't have been able to execute everything this well. He explains that in player versus player, deceiving the enemy with false information is crucial. Ains cites examples, such as changing his armor to mislead Shalter about the effectiveness of holy attacks and pretending fire damage had no effect. He also used false data, life to mislead health checks. Furthermore, Perorancino shared Shalter's details with Ains during her creation, so he knew her abilities from the start. Ains pretended ignorance to encourage bolder use of her skills. He claims to know her almost as well as his own creation, Pandora's actor. Shaltier is shocked by this and this engages her. She charges at Ains, but he quickly activates Perfect Warrior to wield Touch Me's equipment and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, just as he planned. Servants are watching them. Albedo says, this is Touch Me Sama's armor. Cossidus notes that one can only wear this armor when they are world champion class, while Demiurge calls him Perfect Warrior. Albedo is pleased that Ains has thought so far ahead. Meanwhile, Ains attacks Shaltier, and she cries out in pain, recognizing that the sword belongs to Take Mikazuchi Hakushiki, which Ains is wielding right now. Ains tells her that Ains Ulgaon does not know defeat. The strength of 41 people of Ains Ulgaon stands before her, and she had no chance of winning from the start. Shaltier is a bit scared. He charges towards her to attack. And then Shaltier creates an opening when his weapon cuts through her left arm's armor. She tries to fight back, but Ains drops his weapon and grabs a stick, revealing another weapon, Nishikian Rai's dual wield. Shaltier's arm is gone from the previous attack, and Ains continues to attack. 
he hits her triceps, and she realizes they have holy element in them and tries to kick him. The Ains uses another weapon a giant hand, punches her and sends her flying. This enraged her but before she could do anything, he's already ready with his new weapon, that she called Howie's bow and that once belonged to Perrincino. Just when she realized that everything went according to what Ains decided, he shoots an arrow at her. She tries to counter it but gets hit. She angrily charges towards him, and he breaks another stick and brings out a giant axe called Blood Sucking Meat Devourer. Viewing the fight, Cossidus declares Ain't Sama has won. Demiurge asks why the battle seems far from over. Cossidus explains that Shaltir has given up on defense and put everything into offense. Other than that, she has no choice. As they watch their fight, Albedo says everything is going according to what Ain't Sama planned. Now back in the fight, they both are exchanging hits. While fighting, Shaltir feels that Ains will run out of HP before her. She falls back and says, Looks like you're going to run out of HP soon. Ains asks, Do you really think so? Just then, Bukibuku Chagma's voice alerts Ains that the timer on his watch has run out. Shaltir is confused. Ains declares this is the end of our battle and changes his weapon for a shield. She asks, What are you saying? I still have more HP than you. He tells her, but that's not enough for a super tier magic attack. Hearing this, she starts attacking him, but he deflects her attack with a shield. He changes into his mage form and uses super tier magic. The ability Ains used requires time to activate, so Shaltir mocks and asks Ains why he is using magic that has a long cast time. But then she sees another item in his hand that can fasten the activation time. As he's breaking the item, Shaltir is about to attack him, but something frightens her for a second, and as she looks back, he finishes breaking the item and casts magic fallen down, and everything turns white. She hails Ains Ulgaon, the supreme one that is truly the strongest in Nazarek, and she fades away. Realizing that the battle has ended, Aura gets up and starts leaving. Mare asks, what about the battle? Aura replies, Ains Sama won, and they head back to Nazarek. Everyone is back in Nazarek's throne room. Albedo checks that Shaltir's name won't appear now. As Ains prepares for her resurrection, Demiurge says, If things like these happen in the future, my lord, don't take action by yourself. We will take care of that. Albedo says, You are very precious to us, Ains Sama, as you are the only supreme lord who didn't leave us till the end. Ains says, You're right, and tells everyone, Guardians, protect me, and everyone bows their heads. Now, he starts the resurrection process. The price to revive Shaltir is 500 million gold. He uses his staff to start, and all the gold starts melting, joining to revive Shaltir. Everyone watches the process, and Shaltir is back. Albedo checks her name, and it also appears. She says, she's no longer under mind control. Ains goes towards Shaltir and covers her up since she came back naked. He wakes her, and as she opens her eyes, he holds her and says, I'm glad you're back and apologizes that everything was because of his mistake. Shaltir says, it's impossible for you to make a mistake and proceeds to hug him. Albedo gets jealous and says, you need rest, and she makes face. Shaltir then asks, what's going on? Did I cause some trouble? She doesn't remember anything. Ains realizes she doesn't remember who used the world item on her. He tells her to check herself, she checks and says, everything is fine. But when she checks in, she cries out, my chest is gone. Shaltir scolds her, don't say such things when Ains Sama is around, and guardians make faces. Demiurge also scolds her, and she gets scared. As all the guardians are conversing with her, Ains just watches them. He remembers his guild members. When he reaches out, he remembers it's not them. Just then, Albedo looks toward him, realizing he's feeling a bit low. She approaches him, extends her hand, and as he grabs it, she pulls him, saying, Please scold Shaltir as well. See, Ossidus says, you should give her some harsh words. Aura says, don't hold back on this idiot, Ain't Sama. Mare says, but don't be too harsh. While Demiurge tells Shaltir to accept Ain't Sama's words properly, Ains comes down and starts laughing. Everyone watches him silently. He then says, it was my fault to underestimate things, we'll be careful from now onwards. He tells Shaltir, you aren't guilty of anything, and she thanks him. Ains instructs Demiurge to tell Shaltir everything that happened. Ains admits that he may have underestimated things a bit, and that there are enemies out there that could damage Nazarek. He plans on strengthening Nazarek by making an army of undead. Albedo says that human corpses can only make undead of level 40 or below, but Aura has found a village of lizardmen. So, why not attack and destroy them? Now in a church, a man bows his head to the priests of the slain theocracy. He talks about how the Black Scripture, the strongest sector of the slain theocracy, was defeated by a mere vampire. 
Lady Care was injured by the vampire before the mind control was complete, so they had to retreat. Meanwhile, in e Rantel, Enfira and his grandma are going to Karn village under Nabe's protection. They leave for the village. When they arrive, Henry waves to them as she's waiting outside with a red-haired Pleiades named Lupus Regina Beta. Lupus Regina informs them that Aunt Sama has ordered her to take care of them. Now, in the re kingdom capital, it's raining and dark outside. Sebas is writing a letter, and Solution, in her maid uniform, is serving him tea. Together, they gaze outside at the somber, rain-soaked sky. Meanwhile, the head warrior gaze of Stranoff is running in the rain and sees a man sitting in an alley. He recognizes him as Brain Unglaus, the same man who encountered Shaltir. When he hears his name, the man looks up and says Gazef's name. The next day, Momonga opens the door to the guild taverns with his shiny adamantite plate. Adventurers call him the raven black hero, Momon, and Nabe, the beautiful princess. They talk about their victory. Ains approaches the clerk, asking for a new mission. Unfortunately, she apologizes, explaining that there's currently no request big enough for him. Just then, Ains gets a call and he heads to his room. While on the call, a determined spark lights up his eyes, showing he's eager for a new quest. Let's aim for 1 million likes. We will make more beautiful video like this. And what is her favorite thing about this story? I always read each and every one of your comments. So comment right now and don't forget, you guys are the best.